longer extraordinary, but I believe vital for this church, vital for what lies ahead, vital for what God wants to do. Jesus, be the center. Be the fire in my heart. Be the wind in these sails. Be the reason I live. Jesus, be my vision. (laughs) So important for the life of this church, for you as an individual. Father, I pray that you might minister your word this morning, that it will be anointed by your Holy Spirit, that we'll receive it, Lord, as the word of the living God. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll protect us from all distraction, from the enemy trying to snatch the seed away. Lord, you're saying something to us already, and I pray, Lord, it'll be clarified as we look at your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to speak this morning about a passion that pursues the purpose of God. It is so important that you and I have a passion. Otherwise, everything we do, everything we say is just meaningless. When, when we talk about prayer, and we need to talk about prayer. When, when, when we talk about reading God's Word, when we talk about outreach activities, when, when we talk about worship, Everything must come from that passion that is pursuing the will of God for our lives. Now, in the early 18th century, when compromise, complacency, and lack of commitment filled the church, God raised up a man by the name of John Wesley. And God raised up this man and and moved across this nation in revival fire. This nation was changed dramatically. But you know, John Wesley was the most unlikely person to ever be chosen. Why did God choose John Wesley? At that time, he was not only spiritually dry, some would say he was spiritually dead. Uh, He was an Anglican minister and uh, would minister from church to church and and, and preach, but he wasn't converted. He wasn't born again. And so, one day, he met some Moravian Christians who were on fire, who had a passion in their hearts. A group of Moravian Christians that loved Jesus with all their heart, and he saw something in them that he wanted for himself. He saw reality in their life that wasn't in his heart. And and as as he watched this and God moved upon his heart, he said, my heart has been strangely warmed. And he came into a conversion, transforming experience because of what he saw in the lives of other people. Never underestimate what God can accomplish through one person. Never underestimate what God could do through you, through, through this church. People look and they're watching, and when they see that measure of reality, when they see that love for Jesus, that, you know, it takes away all the intellectual arguments, all the hang-ups that people have with, with theology. When people see others that are on fire for God and have a passion in their hearts, it speaks volumes to them. One simple verse then for us to consider. Philippians 3, verse 13. Paul says, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Isn't it wonderful when the Christian life can be so simple? One thing. That's all you need to be concerned about. Yeah, you know, we can get taken up with strategies and we can get taken up with principles and we can taken up with ten steps to this and, and five steps to, uh, to that. And we can make our Christian lives so very complicated. But Paul here, with a passion in his heart, with a vision burning within him, he says, one thing I do. Forgetting what lies. We've got to deal with the past, haven't we? And and it's worth reminding ourselves that the past can be just an hour ago, something that happened an hour ago. It it could be a week ago, a month ago. The past could be a year ago or, or, or 20 years ago. But if there's anything that is subduing us, anything that is robbing us of this passion and this and this love and this this fire, if there's anything 
that is affecting us from the past, the very first thing we've got to do before we're going to be fruitful, before anything significant is going to happen through our lives and through the church, the first thing we've got to do is put it behind us and then strain forward to what lies ahead. No dragging of the feet. <laughs> no, no reluctance to, to, to get involved, but straining forward to what lies ahead. Now, let me show you that it was a passionate purpose that motivated God to send Jesus, that, that this extraordinary plan of, of salvation. God's plan to redeem mankind back to Himself, to raise up a kingdom that could not be shaken, to restore the honor and the glory of His name, was all contained within a tiny, invisible-to-the-eye seed planted in the womb of Mary. We read of God's plan in Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And then in verse 7 it says, The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall accomplish it. God puts the whole weight of who He is, the God that fills the universe, the whole weight of who He is, His strength and His power behind that purpose. I mean, it's got to come to pass. There's nothing that could ever stand in its way or hinder or, or, or delay it because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish it. Now, that same passion is what characterized the life of Christ when He came to fulfill God's will. Just consider that passion when Jesus came to confront the corruption in the house of God. What passion as He turned over the, 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 the tables of the money changers, as He drove out from the temple, the money changes, as he must have list, lifted his voice, as he, he must have been strong in emotion when he said, you have made my house a den of thieves. It shall be called a house of prayer. That, that you can't do that in a sort of politically correct, sort of gentle, mild manner. That there was a, an intense degree of passion that the disciples noticed, and it, they said this, Z John 2 verse 17, zeal for your house has eaten me up. Jesus was consumed with a passion to see God's will come to pass. What I'm saying this morning is that our lives should reflect this enthusiastic passion in all that we do. Romans 12 and verse 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Do you notice there's something here that we've got to take responsibility for? We've got to keep our spiritual fervor fervor. If we don't keep our spiritual fervor, we'll lose it. It'll be snatched away by the enemy. And the reason why this is so important, particularly in the context of the end times in which we live, is because of what Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 12. Jesus is speaking about the last days, and He's giving clear indication as to the signs that can be observed to help us know that we're in the last days. He said wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquake, famine, uh, false prophets, etc. And then he says this, the love of many shall grow cold. The, the, the love of not, not a few, and we're not talking about the unconverted, they've got no love for God, but the love of many will grow cold. They'll lose that spiritual fervor. We see this clearly, don't we, in the book of Revelation. The church at Ephesus had lost their first love. They'd not kept their spiritual fervor. The church at Laodicea were neither hot nor cold. They were lukewarm. They'd lost their spiritual fervor. And unless we take responsibility it's not the pastor's job, it's not a, 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 a friend's job, it, it, it's our job to keep our spiritual fervor. If we don't take that responsibility, we'll lose it. Now, in the light of that, let me ask you a very important question. When we think about the race that's set before us, 
Let's bear in mind when, when, when Paul was speaking about straining forward to what lies ahead, he was using the imagery of a runner pursuing the prize, and every muscle, every tissue, every sinew of his body was straining forward to accomplish that. Let me ask you, are you stumbling along, slipping back, or straining forward? You, you see, we're in one camp or the other. There's no other place for us to be th th this morning. Jesus said, he that is not for me is against me. We're either stumbling along, slipping back, or straining forward. Now, we can all get weary, can't we? We can all get physically tired and tired emotionally and spiritually. It can be a struggle at times to stay focused and to stay motivated, particularly after two years of COVID. I mean, let's face it, the, the, the church is really the right thread. Our nation today has been so wearied by all that has gone on with COVID. But God wants you and me to be a hundred percent for Him, straining forward in our relationship with Christ, straining forward in anticipation about what God is going to do through our lives, straining forward to be obedient to His will. Now, this is not striving in the energy of the flesh. It's simply wanting to be our best for God. It's having that passion in our heart. It's the outworking of saying, God, be the fire in my heart. Be the wind in my sails. Be the reason I live. Be the center. Be my vision. And everything flows out from that point. We need that passion within us. Personally, these last few weeks, well, I say weeks, but the weeks preceding uh, Christmas, over the Christmas period, uh, my wife and I, Gail, uh, you know, she, uh, we've been incredibly tired and found it so extraordinary, very, very difficult I indeed, due to the fragile mental health of, of uh, Naomi, my youngest daughter. Even throughout the whole of the pandemic of two years, we've never experienced such a time of stress and weariness. The day after Boxing Day, Naomi tried to take her life again. And that's the fifth time in 18 months. And I found myself at the place of state saying, Lord, how do I stay in a place of straining forward when I'm bewildered and burdened and battered by all these cares of life. How can I stay at a place of straining forward? It was all Gail and I could do to crawl out of bed every morning to look after the grandchildren that Naomi left behind. One three and a half and the other five every morning having to, to do that. Exhausting it was. Do you know, in all of this, God reminded me of the importance of walking together with Him. The one who says, come unto me. All that are weak and that are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And you shall find rest for your soul. Hallelujah. That's the most wonderful thing in the world, isn't it? To have rest for your soul. I can say to you this morning that whatever goes on, whatever events take place, whatever I'm confronted by, I've got rest for my soul because my rest is in Him. And the key is walking together with Him. Because it was over the Christmas period, it reminded me of the words of King George VI in his famous um, Christmas Day speech way back in 1939. Do you know, his words then were relevant, but just as relevant today. At that time, Britain was at war with Germany for three months. The, 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 the gloom and the anxiousness about the future, the foreboding about what the future held, ju just covered the nation. There was anxiousness and there was a sense of uncertainty and insecurity in moving forward. And King George VI stood up, made his address, and he quoted these words, I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, 
Give me a light that I might tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be better than light and safer than a known way. I want to encourage you this morning with all that God has got for you in the future, <laughs> in all that lies ahead that is exciting and wonderful and will require change and adjustment. And I want to encourage you to put your hand into the hand of God, to be aware and conscious that you're walking together with Him. You haven't got to make it by yourself. <laughs> Nothing is going to happen of any significance on your own, but put your hand into the hand of God. Now, as we consider that this morning, as we put our hand into the hand of God, there are three important things that strengthens us and helps us keep our spiritual fervor, particularly in times of difficulty. Number one, the purpose of God. Number two, the protection of God. And number three, the power of God. Let's have a look firstly at the purpose of of God. You and I, if we're going to achieve anything, if our life is, is going to leave its mark, if we're going to be fruitful, we must know more clearly than we do at the moment the purpose of God for our lives, the purpose of God for this church. <laughs> Somebody once said, if, the, if you aim at nothing, the devil will make sure you score a bullseye. And it's true, isn't it? That, that, that vision, that sense of purpose, the plan that God has revealed gives us direction. It gives us motivation. It gives us something to, to aim for. Otherwise, we'll just be going round and round in circles. I'm sure you've had enough of that. <laughs> I'm sure my life has had a, a, enough of going round in, in circles, just doing good things. But when God steps in, when God begins to intervene, and, and, and you've got that clear sense of His purpose, it makes all the difference. Jesus said in John 4 and verse 34, my food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Jesus came with a very clear sense of purpose. But I want you to notice something extremely significant about the context that Jesus is saying that in. You, you, you see, the disciples were hungry. They were concerned about their, their, their bellies, and they, they were talking to Jesus, aren't you hungry, Jesus? And you, you must be hungry, it's time to, to eat now. But notice how Jesus shifts the focus from the natural and the material to the spiritual. His response to that question, is, you're hungry, it's time to eat. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. What I'm saying is this, there needs in this church, there needs to be in your heart a shift of focus away from the material and away from the, 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 the natural. Set your thoughts upon heaven where Christ is. And, and, and it starts when we shift our focus. But being able to keep our spiritual fervor is when our cares aren't, uh, concerns aren't on the cares of this world, when our thoughts aren't on what is going on around us. But it's His will, His purpose that we've come to fulfill. Each one of us needs a clear sense of purpose. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 26 says, I do not run aimlessly, nor is one beating the air. Paul had a direction to move in. He could see the objective, the reason for his life was to fulfill what God had called him to. That's why he was able to stand before King Agrippa and say, O King Agrippa, I have not been disobedient to the heavenly vision. That's why he could say at the end of his life, I fought a good fight, I kept the faith, I finished my course, and I'm ready to meet you, Jesus. <laughs> Oh, how wonderful it is when we can have that clear sense of purpose. If that is vague or unknown, we certainly won't be straining forward with any spiritual fervor. You see, if it's vague or unknown, we'll find ourselves somewhat flat, somewhat demotivated. Purpose ignites passion. But life without purpose 
is pointless. It's simply motion without meaning. And there could, isn't there a lot of motion in churches today? A lot of activities, a lot of good things, and a, a lot of impressive things. And people are trying to do their best. And we, and we need to be careful, don't we, that we're not just full of good works and we're full of good ideas and we're, we're, we're full of the, the latest thing because so and so is doing it. Well, all we've got to do, and then it'll be just like that, it'll work. Motion without meaning. And the meaning, of course, is that attitude, Jesus, be the fire in my heart be the wind in my sail, be the reason I live, be my vision. Jesus, it's a reality of, of relationship there. And, and so, it's pointless, meaningless, unless that is established with, within us. God's plan and purpose for us all is seen right throughout Scripture. In Jeremiah 1 verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart, and I appointed you. Jesus said in John 15, verse 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you that you should bear fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. Now, this is true not just for the missionary, the evangelist, the full-time worker, the pastor. It's true for every born-again believer that God has got a purpose for our life. But listen, the unfolding of that purpose depends on whether or not we will live in harmony with God's will, whether we'll follow carefully His instructions. Paul knew in his own heart the importance of God's will, and he wanted to impress that upon other people. I want to impress it upon you as a church today. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1. Paul says, having received this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Yes, <laughs> you don't get discouraged. You don't allow yourself to lose that spiritual fervor. You keep on track when you know the will of God for your life. And Paul considered that was so important so vital for the believer that he wrote in Colossians 1, verse 9 and 10, we do not cease to pray for you, asking that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing unto Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Do you notice Paul wouldn't give up praying that for the church? And he prayed that they wouldn't just have a glimmer, a glimpse of what the will of God, he, he prayed that they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will. That, that's the normal Christian life. Don't let the devil kid you into to thinking that this mystical sort of vagueness is, is, is of God. No, clarity is of God. Yes. Knowing God's plan and, and, and God's purpose. Because notice how everything flows from being filled with the knowledge of of God's will. We walk worthy of the Lord, we're fully pleasing to Him, we bear fruit in every good work, and we increase in the knowledge of God. Let me just press home the importance of clearly understanding the plan and purpose of God with the illustration of a, a building. Long before any building is developed, the architect first sees and writes down his plan. Then he gives it to the builders to begin work. All the details are settled and in place, even minute details, before the very first spade of soil is removed from the, the ground. What's required is that those that are given the plan follow precisely the instructions laid down. It's the same with you and me. There's a blueprint for our lives, blueprint for this church. And, and, and that's in the heart of God that He wants to reveal to us but we've got to follow carefully those instructions. It's then that something begins to emerge that, that is noticed, something that is worthy, something that is impressive, something that is eye-catching starts to be raised up when the plan is followed. So, the first thing to keep our spiritual fervor, in difficult times especially, we must know more clearly than we do at the moment, the purpose 
of God. Secondly, to keep that spiritual fervor, we need to trust more fully in the protection of God. <laughs> to believe that God actually is watching over our lives. The angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear Him, and He delivers them. And, and God is not only watching over our lives, He's watching over His Word. The Bible says He watches over His Word to perform it. God is bringing it to pass. God is causing it to happen. But we've got to be in the right place at the right time, and, and we've got to see the significance of our role. Now, look at the confidence that Paul had about this. In Philippians 1, verse 6, he starts by saying, being confident of this, he who has begun a good work in you shall bring it through to completion. <laughs> oh, we have a few hiccups on the way and a few setbacks and no, but what God has started, He'll bring through. The zeal of the Lord of hosts shall bring it to pass. We find this in 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded. Oh, that we might be persuaded this morning. I am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. I want you this morning to commit something to the Lord. To, to commit that, that call that He's got upon your life, to commit that vision that He has for you, to commit your part in that, to commit it unto God, and He will watch over it. He will bring it to pass. In Psalm 138, verse 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. Do you know, we're only here this morning because of God's protection. He's brought us through COVID. <laughs> the hymn writer said, Through many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe thus far, and it's grace that'll lead me home. We're here. I mean, dangers seen and unseen, we've been protected from. We'll never know, really, till we get to, to heaven, the things that we've been fully protected from. Do you know, there's incidents on the, on the road while we've been driving, those situations, or, or, or maybe accidents at work, that, those circumstances of ill health, when, when things could have been far more serious, but the goodness of God has kept us. We need to trust more fully in the protection of God. Now, while most Christians desire to get from where they are in life to where God wants them to be, do you know, some are completely oblivious to any threat against their expected destination. It reminds me of an amusing story uh, that I heard about a plane journey where the pilot announced over the intercom, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, but I have to inform you that we've lost one of the engines. But there's no need to worry. It'll just mean we'll be arriving an hour later than anticipated. 30 minutes later. A second announcement came. Don't be alarmed, but I'm afraid another engine has just gone. We'll now be arriving two hours later to our destination. Not long afterwards, the pilot apologized again, saying, I'm so sorry, but our third engine is now lost. It'll take four hours longer than scheduled. At this point, one of the passengers turned to her husband and said, I'm starting to get really worried now. If that last engine goes, we'll be up here all night. And you know, some people are completely oblivious. The devil roams around like a roaring lion, seeking those whom he may devour. The devil's come to steal, kill, and destroy. The, 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 sometimes we're oblivious of the dangers that are there and the importance of staying under the protective hand of God. Do you know, when we step out of His will, when we step out to do our own thing, that's the most dangerous place in the world. There's no protection for us there. But under the protective hand of God, that is where the Lord wants us to be. Now, let me just illustrate this because, do you know, while, while there's danger that lies ahead, and well, if you thought last two years with COVID were pretty grim and had their heartaches and, uh, and problems, let me tell you the future isn't going to be any different. 
I mean, thank God for the joys, the blessings, the goodness of God, the exciting uh, discoveries that, that we'll make, the things that we'll do. But I want you to know the future is going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. If we really believe we're living in the last days, <laughs> then there's all manner of problems that lie ahead. But if we're trusting in the protection of God, He will bring us through. Amen. He will take us to the other side and we'll accomplish all that He's purposed us to do. I, I want to illustrate it like this. The barren womb of Sarah stood against the promise of Isaac and the nation of Israel being conceived. The intention of Pharaoh to kill every newborn Hebrew boy was against the prospect of Moses growing up and becoming Israel's deliverer. The threat of Goliath was against David becoming king. The plot of Herod was against the infant Jesus surviving and going on to the cross. The scheming of Satan was against Peter becoming a great apostle when Jesus said, Peter, Satan's demanded to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And the gates of hell were and still are against the advance of the church. But Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, simply because God's watching over your life, God's watching over His Word, and He will bring it to pass whatever tries to derail it, as long as our heart is towards Him. Thirdly then, just to finish on, having looked at the importance of knowing more clearly the purpose of God, having considered the importance of trusting more fully the protection of God. If we're going to keep our spiritual fervor, if we're going to stay on track and accomplish great things for God, thirdly, we must walk more confidently in the power of God. The power, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead. That power that is within us, greater is He that is within you than He that is within the world. Listen to what C.H. Spurgeon said, without the Spirit of God we can do nothing. We are ships without the wind, branches without sap, and like coals without fire. So we can have a, a great vision and a, a, a wonderful expectation and, and we can plan this and, and, and plan that. But of course, God has said it's not by your own might. It's not by your own power, it's by my Spirit, said the Lord. And it's those lives that are wholly yielded to the Spirit of God, filled with the very life and breath of God, that things begin to happen. And what we need in the church today, in this nation, is a great awakening to that same power. The same power we see throughout the Gospels and the same power we see throughout the book of Acts, it's been almost as though the last two years, the church in our nation has been in hibernation. It's been anesthetized. And God's call is going out to the church to rise up, to stand out, speak up, move forward. And I believe we see that in Isaiah 52, verse 1. Awake, awake, O Zion. Come clothe yourself with strength, the strength and the might of of Almighty God. It was Franklin Roosevelt, America's 32nd president, who once said, I doubt if there is a single problem, political or economic, that will not melt before the fire of a spiritual awakening. Oh, I'm, don't you think we're due for a, a revival in this nation? It's been a long, long time. Books have been written, songs have been sung, and prayers have been prayed, and we're believing God for a breakthrough in the nation. I can't wait for revival. I, I want to be at that place right now where my heart is on fire, where my heart is fixed towards Him. I want to be ready for God to use me in revival. The best is yet to come. Amongst all the tears and all the difficulties, all the frustrations, God is on the move. Thank God for what He's doing right across the world. Revivals that are going on right now, right across the world, but our heart cries out, Lord, do it again, Lord, here in our nation. And I never cease to be amazed what God can accomplish so quickly in a revival. Just refer to the 
just one example of so many, the, the Welsh revival. How is it ever possible for a hundred thousand people to be converted and added to the churches of Wales in just three months? <laughs> it's just inconceivable. But that's what God did as revival fire swept throughout that country. And, and then, of course, that spread across to Azusa Street, a little uh, uh, meeting in a shack, just, I don't know, half a dozen, 20 people there, and the Azusa Street revival burst into flame and swept across the world. It's not how many we've got that makes any difference, but whether or not we're prepared to yield ourselves wholly, cry unto Him, and keep on crying, keep on believing, keep on trusting, relying on His awesome power. We need a faith that burns brightly and not one that is flickering faintly. The power of God's Holy Spirit is essential for three basic reasons. Number one, to overcome sin. Number two, to be effective in Christian service for the Lord. Number three, to live victoriously against Satan. Now, who doesn't battle with temptation? Who doesn't need to overcome sin? Temptation is there for all of us. Do you know, it doesn't matter whether you're the Archbishop in Rome or the Archbishop in Rome. It doesn't matter whether you're the Archbishop in, in Canterbury or, or, or the Pope in Rome. The, the, there's temptation that besets every single person. To be tempted isn't sin in itself. It's just an invitation to sin. But the only way we can overcome sin is very clear in the Scriptures. Galatians 5 verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We can find victory when we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we continue to walk in the power of God, to be effective in Christian service for the Lord. Well, we, we can accomplish some things, but very, very little in our own ability. Look what's accomplished in Acts 4 verse 33. And with great power, the apostles gave their witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And the church just, just spread so quickly, grew so rapidly because of the power of the Holy Spirit throughout the book of Acts to live victoriously against Satan. When when Paul spoke about the Christian's warfare in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, uh, do you know some people get so preoccupied with demons, uh, some people just want to talk about what the devil can do and the, 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 the devil's power. The devil's got absolutely no power except that which we give him. The, the open doors in our life, the landing strips in our life through disobedience or com compromise or, or, or complacency. And, and we don't come to talk about what the devil's able to do, but look how the devil can be defeated. We can be victorious against Satan. Ephesians 3, sorry, Ephesians 6 verse 10. Stand strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. The full power of Almighty God, it dwells within us. There's not one person here that hasn't got that, that, that wonderful power of God, but we just need to release it and then continually be filled and walk in the good of that. One last scripture, Ephesians 3 verse 16. Paul is praying here for the church at Ephesus, and he prays that they might be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. That's where it counts deep down inside there, that we're walking in the power and the might of God. So, in conclusion, because you and I have been made in God's image, your life can never be insignificant and should never be aimless. Within each one of us, there's a God-given destiny that we need to achieve. Therefore, coming back to the question that we started with, are you stumbling along, slipping back, or straining forward? God wants every one of us to be 100%. So, let's come this morning and say, Lord, I, I need to 
see an increase in my passion. <laughs> that when I'm singing songs like, be the fire in my heart, be the wind in my sails, be the reason that I live, be my vision. That it's something that we, we, we feel, we mean, and it, it's reaching out to God in a wonderful way. Let's come this morning and say, Lord, would you help me see more clearly your purpose for my life? Lord, would you help me trust more fully in your protection? And Lord, would you help me walk more confidently in your power? Let's pray together, shall we? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just take a few moments and commit something to him today. He's able to keep that which you commit unto him against that day. Whatever it is God's been saying. If you need to just get rid of the past, let's put it behind us once and for all. Let's say, God, I want to strain forward to all that you've got for me. If you're vague and uncertain about that plan and purpose, ask God to make it clear. Let's come this morning and say, Lord, I have nothing to fear as I go forward, nothing to be anxious about as I step out, because you're giving me your protection. Help me to trust that more. And if you have an issue of confidence, say, Lord, oh, let, let me be bold. Let me be released from all my anxiousness and fear. I want to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus. Hallelujah. Just settle it in your heart in these few moments. Jesus. Lord, we thank you this morning for the exciting days in which we live. Lord, we thank you that your heart is towards us. There's no doubt about that. And Lord, I pray that each one of us will have that assurance, that, that, that confidence, even now that our, their hearts are toward you, reaching out, straining forward to be their best for you. Thank you, Lord, for the things that you're going to do in this new year. Thank you for the change that's going to come, that at times will be uncomfortable and difficult, but Lord, help us to adjust, adapt to change. And Lord, in these coming days, would you use our lives and make us more fruitful than we've ever been as we look to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's just finish on that song again. Be the fire in my heart. Jesus, be the center. Be the wind in my sails. Just express it as a, a prayer and a heart cry to Him. And let's look forward to what God is going to do. Be the center.